So there are many causes for cancer. What's known is there are cancer uh, abnormal cells which uh, lose the control, um, growth control, because they have mutations. And the mutations are in, in genes like oncogenes, or uh, so they get activated and then cells proliferate, or in genes which are called suppressor genes, tumor suppressor genes, which keep the brakes on cells. So that has been known for quite a while. So these mutations are acquired, and, um, and it's often in stem cells, and they lead to cancer. But there was one curious um, observation, that cancer cells also grow when they don't have a mutation, and they have inactivated genes like tumor suppressor genes. Now, how would this work? Well, as it turned out, this works because these genes get silenced. They're not mutated, but they are not expressed by the, but they, because they get silenced. What's the mechanism of that? And um, so, so let me come, go back to the origins of, of, of this uh, silencing. There was a famous paper in, uh, published in the end of the 80s where people in, 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 in Baltimore looked at colon cancer in humans. And they found that colon cancer is a multi-step um, um, process where the very first step is a benign form of a polyp. So it's a proliferation of, of, um, of cells and they're still benign. You can cut them out and you're fine. And what this um, group found was um, that the uh, global methylation level of the genome in these polyps was, dec uh, was decreased, was hypomethylated. So the conclusion was hypomethylation may be a first and uh, required step in the progression to a cancer. So it was very interesting, very, very influential. So we worked with mice and we made a mutation in the key enzyme which establishes methylation, the methyltransferase. DNA methyltransferase. And um, if you don't have any methyltransferase, you cannot, you will die during development, but you can make mice which have one copy, which works, and they have half of it, half of the enzyme level, and they live perfectly fine. So then we used, so, so in humans, um, um, there is a mutation in a gene which predisposes humans or mice, if they carry the same mutation, to colon cancer. And this was a model, this was the, the disease this uh, um, group in, in Baltimore really used. So we used a similar muta um, um, predisposing mutation in mice. So these mice get a number of these polyps, many actually 100, um, within six months, and then they die because there's so many polyps. So we asked if this group is correct, and we wanted to confirm the model which was established in human cells, that hypomethylation is a... Um, obligatory step in the progression, we just uh, deleted one of the methyltransferase gene, which leads to a slight hypomethylation. The mice are fine. And we expected, or well, the prediction was, the mice would die much faster because they get more tumors. We just got exactly the opposite. So hypomethylation inhibited, inhibited cancer formation. So that was quite unexpected and really led to rethinking what's happening. And so we worked quite a lot on this. What really, and I will come to the, the, to, to the, the chase, what is really the, the, the reason here? The reason is that hypomethylation decreases the way cancer cells silence genes. They silence genes by hypermethylation, too much methylation. But if you have a decreased level of the methyltransferase, which is important for, for the hypermethylation, you decrease the risk of cancer. So that was quite interesting. And when we looked at the genes which are affected by, by this, well, it turned out these are genes um, in mice which also seem to be um, silenced in humans. And when you now hypermethylate, they're not that much silence. So it made quite some sense um, to, to um, it was the first time 
that we could show that methylation is causally involved in cancer because if you could genetically manipulate this methyltransferase. And what the uh, sort of surprising conclusion was, the more methyltransferase you had, the more tumors you had because you get more hypermethylation. So this was a beginning of what's called the epigenetics of cancer. Um, and then there was enormous progress over the next few, uh, few years. It was in the 90s and now in, in this century where people looked at changes in um, the uh, conformation changes in the chromatin or in um, a modulation of um, um, epigenetic modulation of DNA by various modulators. So method methotransferases are one very important one. Others are histone modulases like histone methylases, histone acetylases. All these these mechanisms um, affect gene expression and can, particularly in cancer, can affect gene expression of tumor suppressor genes. And these are the targets for, for um, a cancer cell to escape its normal controls. So what really is no, seems to be the, 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 the picture that some genes in cancer are always mutated. Some P53, a very famous tumor suppressor gene, is never silenced. It's always mutated. It just happens what cancer do. But other genes are most of the time silenced and not mutated. So cancer cells have both these, these ways to escape its controls, its, um, its controls, homeostatic controls, to not to proliferate um, as a cancer cell, either epigenetically or genetically changing, activating or inactivating a gene. So this is a balance between those two. Now we were very interested in this, and I come now back to cloning. So what happens in cloning? Cloning can reset the epigenetic state, but cannot reset a genetic alteration. That's permanent. So we took, we asked the question, when we take a cancer cell, we do, used a melanoma, in mice. We asked, so the melanoma, when you take it and inject it into a cell, uh, into an animal, it makes melanoma. That's what these cancer cells do. So we asked the question, when you take this melanoma nucleus and inject it into an egg of a mouse and develop from this egg an embryonic stem cell, would this embryonic stem cell now, when you inject it into a mouse, would it make a melanoma? Or would you reset it, that it could make a chimeric mouse which could con would be behaving in a way normally, could, could contribute to normal development, like in cloning? So we did that experiment, and it was really quite interesting um, what came out. Indeed, we took these, this melanoma nucleus, put them in an egg, got an embryo. From the embryo, we developed an embryonic stem cell, and the embryonic stem cell, we could inject them into a blastocyst to make a chimeric mouse the normal way you look. And we did get chimeric mice. So what the conclusion was from this, that the egg was able to reset the cancer nucleus to a cell which now could contribute to normal development. But all these chimeric mice got tumors. So the, the conclusion was here that a large part of the phenotype of this cancer cell was epigenetically which was, could be reset by the, by the egg. But there were clearly also genetic alterations which could not be reset, and there led then to cancer. So cloning allowed you to, to differentiate between epigenetic changes and genetic changes. Now, why is that important? Well, epigenetic changes are, as the cloning experiment showed, reversible. Genetic changes are not reversible. So there's a major effort now in the field, in the therapeutic field of cancer, to develop drugs which affect the epigenetic state of a cancer cell. For example, to reactivate a silenced gene by interfering with the epigenetic mechanisms which lead to the silencing of the gene, um, like um, 
enzymes like the methyl transferases, histone transferase, and so on and so forth. And indeed, there are no clinical trials ongoing using such drugs, which show, I think, promising results. So just coming back to the point, epigenetics in principle is reversible. Genetic alterations are not reversible, not by these, these drugs. So I think that's what has um, um, quite some therapeutic potential. And that's, I think, is very important for, potentially important for, for, for uh, treating cancer.